You guys visiting us. Um, hope you're having a good time in Zulu so far. I'm Stasha. I'm Trevor. And we are from UM Dining. I'm the gardens manager. He's the sustainability director. And welcome to the South Avenue Garden. Um, do you want to talk about pharmacology and why it's here? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this What's garden you? is part of our pharmacology and sort of another program that we've started sort of a new brand for all of this activity called Just Eats. Um, but it's one of our two gardens on campus and it's really meant as an educational space and to help supply some of our produce needs. Um, so to back up a little bit, because I'll let Stasha talk more specifics about the garden, but um, UM Dining really sees a lot of opportunity in what we do. We're a large institutional food um, buyer. We serve thousands of students throughout the semester, faculty and staff, and we buy a lot of food. Our food budget um, is somewhere around three and a half million dollars every year. Um, and so thinking about that as a state institution, as a department that's embedded at a, um, an organization of higher learning, we really think that we have a responsibility to um, not just serve healthy, delicious food, but to be productive members of our food system. So. Um, we have a number of initiatives that are all sort of built around that goal of um, educating people, being um, being thoughtful in how we engage in our food system, and helping to make connections through that. So one of those is the Farm to College, where we target local farmers and ranchers and try to procure as much from uh, Montana businesses, Montana farmers, Montana ranchers as we can. Um, the program's been going since 2003, and since that time we've spent over $10 million of our purchasing budget here in the state, so to support Montana agriculture. Um, right now that looks a little less than a quarter of our total budget is going towards Montana products, um, and that really runs the gamut. That's hundreds of different farmers and ranchers and producers and value adders all over the state. Um, oftentimes with this discussion the question comes up well you know we call that local food right and the definition of local is a really sort of nebulous thing and so our definition is basically the state boundaries we're a state institution um, we are partially supported by state tax dollar dollar state tax dollars and so we sort of made sense to us to call local anything grown raised or value added here in the state um, the downside of that is that there's a lot of local stuff that's coming from Idaho and Washington or regional things um, that we don't count. And there are a lot of things that are coming from eastern Montana, hundreds and hundreds of miles, that a lot of people might have a hard time seeing as local products. Um, but that's our definition. Um, we have other purchasing categories for what we call sort of sustainable products. So that could be third-party certified things like coffee and chocolate. Um, Seafood is a big part of that, um, but overall the intent is really to just uh, be very thoughtful and intentional with how we purchase our food, um, how we serve our food, and to try to educate the students especially that eat with us to become thoughtful consumers themselves. I think a lot about that a lot. We serve all these students every day and to the extent that we can educate them about these issues in their food system. Um, my hope is that they then graduate and become thoughtful consumers themselves once they're sort of off and on their own. Um, and so, yeah, this is this is one of two gardens. I'm gonna hand it off to you. We have about a half acre of growing space. It's all organic practices. We're not organically certified because um, that comes with a whole hullabaloo that doesn't really make sense for us. Um, we, the first year, we produced, I planted too much zucchini and we produced about 6,500 pounds of food. Um, now we're at a more reasonable like 5,000-ish pounds of food um, every year. So yes, yeah, so we produce a lot of food out of a small space. I have student interns and employees, so I have between one and five interns every semester and usually two student employees who work part-time with me. Uh, we really try and get the community involved. We do a lot of community workshops. We have preschool tours all the time. We have folks like you come and visit us. Um, so we get to do a lot of really fun community and uh, campus-based activities, which is really great for us. Um, and we can talk about 
This space specifically, this is more traditional row-based agriculture. Um, we practice crop rotation. As you can see, we have a lot of cover crop growing right now. Um, but yeah, it's more straightforward. And then when we go to Lamas and Garden, we have kind of more growing techniques going on there. Um, does anybody have any questions about this space before we do a little walkabout? Let's see what we got going on. This is its third full season. And so what was here before? Just lawn. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. so this was a pretty unused space. Um, we partnered with uh, Residence Life, and they were kind enough to let us turn it into a garden. And Garden City Harvest came down from the peas farm with their big tractor and busted up all the sod for us, which is really awesome. So that is a lot of work. Um, and we just have a little walk behind tractor that couldn't handle that. I like so. a BCS. Yeah, it's a griot, oh, yeah. but yeah. same thing. Yeah, pretty yeah. Much, yeah. But it's been a big part of the journey, I think, is taking what was just, you know, chemically fertilized lawn space and recovering that soil health and building it back up. What's been part of that process? It was actually, um, like, they had to use chemical fertilizer, fertilizers and um, herbicides, but the soil itself was in pretty good shape because it was essentially cover cropped for... You know since forever and hadn't been disturbed um so the tilth was good the organic matter was really good the nutrient levels were pretty good we're just trying to you know change the methods that are used but we do minimal tilling we use a harrow every spring and then we leave everything in place in the fall lots of living mulches lots of leaves um season extension we've got some rime and some um straw going on and yeah and we grow this year we grew more than 80 varieties of crops, so we have a lot of diversity going on, which is really fun for me. How much of your um, your output goes into the UM Foods? That is a is fabulous that... question because it's all of it. All of it, yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. So that's a big part of the idea is that, like, of course I can only provide a tiny percentage of the food that's consumed in the university because there's thousands of people. Um, but it all goes back to the students. It goes to the Iron Grizz restaurant right there as part of dining. It goes to the food zoo. Um, Harvest and the food court has been a good partner for me in the past. It's used by the catering department. Um, so it goes all over, but it's all consumed within the campus community. Yeah, so none of it travels more than a half mile. Sometimes I have to take it back there and wash it and then move it back here. But that's all. Question. Uh, how old is this garden? This is his third season. Third season. And then the Lamison Garden is in its eighth year. Yeah. Eighth year. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Does any of the product go into the culinary program? No, we don't do a lot with uh, Missoula College, unfortunately. That's a relationship that we would like to build up more because it seems really natural. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Great questions. Yeah. Anybody else? Do you use any amendments besides the mulch? Um, we, oh, so we have a great, you want to talk about compost now? Sure. So we have an awesome compost program that we do in partnership with the Peas Farm. Um, and in the food zoo, where most of y'all will probably have lunch today, we have what's called a SOMAT machine, which is, is a pulper and then a dehydrator system. So all of the stuff that usually can't be composted, like ketchup, meat, eggshells you know whatever is left over from a plate and the napkins is scraped into the pulper and then goes into the dehydrator and it creates this like sawdust like material so we haul that and all of the coffee grounds from our operations at campus so i take it from the food zoo from our catering department from all of our coffee ops but one just because the building's under construction and i can't get there um, and that all goes to the peas farm and that is way more compostable material than i can handle with my space and the machinery i have but they have their giant compost pile and we add it there every week. They turn it for us because they have that big old tractor. And then every spring and fall, I'm allowed to take from that pile. And so that is our primary amendment um, that we use here for compost. We also create our own compost. Uh, we work all of this organic matter into the soil, but that's like a really cool, the Peace Farm Partnership is like a really awesome win-win for everybody because they get more material and then we get to compost our waste and take some back. Compost co-op. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's <laughs> awesome. Fueled by this very, very cool van yes. over here. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> uh, but that's, a, I mean, it's a nice part of that cycle. There's over a thousand pounds of food waste that comes out of just the food zoo every day, every week. Um, and so 
Part of the reason we have that pulp or dehydrator system is that that shrinks the volume and weight of that down by about 80 to 90 percent. So having that much food waste would just be an unmanageable amount um, for Sasha to be moving around. She'd have to be doing that a couple times a day probably versus about once a week, which is what we have now. Um, and then the partnership with the Peas Farm is also really critical because that end product, um, it is really basically a carbon input. It, it ends up, that dehydrator is just a big electric oven. And so it cooks a lot of the nutrients out of that. Um, and so, you know, a healthy compost system should really be a balance of nitrogen and carbon. And that ends up just being all carbon, but the Peas Farm is putting enough nitrogen inputs into their piles that um, it able, it's, allows it to balance that. So. You said a thousand pounds of wheat of food waste out of the food zoo? The last food waste audit that was done, and that was like before my time, so maybe five years ago, that's about what they hit, yeah. And that's end user, that's not like kitchen scraps or anything, that's just what gets, right? That's what gets scraped off the plates? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it's different. So it could be more. Really it yeah. could be. Yeah. Um, it's a good time to talk about wheat half. Yeah, you should be questioning it. Oh! Uh, do you yes. get any vandalism at all? Thankfully, not yet. I'm going to knock on some right now. Right. Uh, we do have, like, we, we'll go visit the ducks. We do have them, like, locked up and stuff just in case of shenanigans. But so far, we, like, eventually, or every once in a while, there's a beer can that someone throws in here, but that's the worst that I've seen, which is great. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, should food we? Food waste? Yeah. Oh, food waste. Or a like, lean path food waste? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that number, the thousand pounds, is an old food waste audit from what guests go through and then scrape their plates on. Um, we also have programs in place to capture a lot of the pre-consumer stuff. So the vast majority of what we work with is um, whole produce, whole ingredients in scratch cooking. It's probably 90% of what the kitchens use, which is great. Um, but with that, you often get a lot of waste, trim waste, um, all sorts of stuff. And so we have, we subscribe to a software called Lean Path, and in our kitchen, our production kitchen, we have an iPad connected to a scale. And so the culinary staff has been trained that anytime they're going to compost anything or, if, um, you know, donate it to the food bank or whatever that is, anything that then ends up in that waste stream is first weighed and cataloged through this software. So they'll put the item up there, they'll log in with their name, It'll capture what time it is, and then they'll put the information of what that material is. Um, so there are a number of benefits to that. One is just the awareness that it reminds that culinary worker time and time again, I'm, I'm doing something, I'm wasting this, you know? Like, and it's not necessarily because they've done something wrong, but it's just that sort of gentle reminder of, wow, here's 20 pounds of potato skins, or here's 10 pounds of trim pork fat, or whatever that is. Um, the other thing that it does is it allows our chefs to be more accurate with their forecasting. This is one of the hardest things with large-scale food um, operations is trying to think about how much food am I going to need tonight. Our, you know, we know how many students we have on campus, we know through history about how many extra people come through, but it's a guessing game every day, every meal really, as far as how much should we make. And, um, you know, especially in departments like catering, the sort of worst thing you can do is run out of food for a client. And so the industry standard has always been overproduce. You know, we know we're going to need eight pans of this, let's make ten. So the Lean Pass software really gives us insight into some of the hard data about what's being wasted, how much overproduction is happening, and it gives the chefs a higher level of confidence to say, okay, Every time we've made lasagna, we've made 10 sheet pans of it, and we've had to donate three. And so let's make eight instead of 10 and plan on donating one. Um, so, and then it also gives us into insight as to maybe our culinary staff, specific ones, might need better knife skills or more training on something. So you could look and say, you know, when John peels potatoes, he ends up with twice as much waste as when Sarah does it. Let's go talk to John and see how he's peeling potatoes. Um, so a lot of these upstream solutions to food waste that aren't quite as sort of sexy and marketable as some of the downstream ones, but are way more impactful because you're avoiding that problem before you've even created it. Um, and then the other component that's happening there is, as I mentioned, is that relationship with the food bank. And so if 
we've produced food and we haven't put it out on the lines and nobody has put a spoon into it or anything, that food is safe for donation. Um, and so the food bank comes around regularly a couple times a week and collects all of our overproduction um, as part of their food circle program. And they take that back to their kitchens and they break it up into small single serve or family size meals that are um, sort of heat and serve packages. Um, and so the nice thing about that is, you know, anytime we do overproduce, at least as an end result for that food, it's hopefully going somewhere into the community to help out. Um, and so all those things are sort of the components of how we're dealing with that waste. And then there are these aspects, again, it's like at the end of the day, we need customer and guest participation in that. So we've done a number of things like take trays out of the dining halls that cut food waste by 60% when they did that. Um, we shrank our glasses from 16 ounces to 12. It's an all you can eat environment in the food zoo. So, you know, you're encouraged, get a plate, fill it up, eat what you want. Um, but when you look at some of these initiatives, they're really sort of working on behavioral psychology and what they call like choice architecture, so designing these spaces to promote better behavior. Um, but even with that, we still have hundreds and hundreds, if not a thousand pounds of food waste every week. Um, and so there is some gentle shaming in our marketing materials in the food zoo that tries to talk about that problem and try to get students to, to be engaged with it because, um, you know, there's, I'll never say that we're doing all that we can but a huge piece of this puzzle is just how much food gets wasted via the guest. What are they picking up and not eating? Um, and so we're trying to address that in a little way. The challenge what there... Kind of, what are the kind of things that you're doing to address it? Like what is the kind of... So there's a, as you walk, and you'll see this if you have lunch today, but as you walk your plate down to the dish room, there's a wall right there on the right, and we've done this big mural on it. Um, with a, a big mound of trash and a sort of apathetic looking millennial with a plate that he's tipping into the garbage pile and it says food zoo guests waste a thousand pounds of food every week. And so we're really you know, pointing the finger right at the guest to say you're a part of this problem. Um, but there was a big discussion around that marketing campaign because at the end of the day we're a customer service department. Um, we have to sell meals, we have to sell meal plans, we have to encourage people to come in and buy our products and our services. And if we make you all feel like schmucks, you probably not want to come back and eat with us. So how far can you push that um, before somebody says, you know what, I, you know, I, I don't really want to go there and eat there anymore because I feel like a schmuck. Um, well, that's something we struggle with with menus as well because like the chicken strip night is famous because it's just always packed and like how do we balance giving 18 year old boys what they would prefer to eat who are like you know away from home for the first time with when you encourage like healthy sustainable local vegetables it's a balance so all the, the all the meal plans are all you can eat i mean that's not a way to do a one time yeah there's one meal plan. So the food zoo is the only sort of all-you-can-eat buffet-style dining on campus. There's a meal plan called um, Food Zoo Unlimited, which means you can go into that food zoo as many times as you want all semester long for one flat price. Um, the downside of that plan is that we have other retail operations around campus, coffee shops. Um, we have a food court with a number of different food kiosks. We have this restaurant you can't use that meal plan there. So you would have to use sort of, there's other ways to put money on your campus card. So you can use that declining balance, you can pay in cash or credit. There's another one that's I think the all campus plan, which is a balance. It's meant to, you know, primarily eating in the food zoo for maybe three quarters of your meals, but then there's all this flexibility to then, if you want to go to the other side of campus and eat there, um, if you want to come out um, to a different location, you can use that there. Um, but that's really hard. I think what Stasha is talking about is, is really one of the sort of trickiest issues that we have is that if you ask people what kind of food do they want, how do they want to eat, they want to eat local, they want to eat healthy, they want to eat organic, they, all those nice things that we're trying to promote. But then when you put this sort of spread of food out in front of them, they're going to go towards the chicken strips and the pizza and the soda and all that stuff. Um, and so, again, the, the most vocal guests that we have are the ones that are really pushing 
I want more vegan stuff. I want more vegetarian stuff. I want more local stuff. Um, and what happens is that we switch some of that. Sometimes you start hearing from these less vocal folks who say, where'd my hamburger go? You know, where'd my chicken strips go? It is absolutely the case that every night we do chicken strip night in the food zoo. It is the busiest night all semester long. Um, but every comment card you read says, I want more vegetarian options, I want more <laughs> vegan things, and all these things. So there's this balance of sort of understanding who that customer is, nudging them in the, you know, in a hopefully a better dietary decisions without bludgeoning them in that direction. Um, so what that might look like for us is like the chicken strips are smaller. You, know, you have to be like kind of tricky. Yeah. Or our hamburger, they're all grass um, finished beef, all local, and it's, it's 30 percent mushrooms. So it's just like, you know, little tweaks here and there to try and make it work for everybody. And we don't really tell people that. Like, yeah. <laughs> we'll tell you that, but. Yeah. Um, unless they watch this video. Exactly. Yeah, unless they watch the video. But I think th that sort of falls into this funny category of like what the industry calls stealth health, which is just fooling people into eating better. Um, and so there are some components of that too. Um, but it's really hard. I mean, food is such a personal thing mm -hmm. and people feel really passionately about it. And so trying to, you know, create a program that serves really healthy food, that educates people about their food system is a wonderful thing, but people become, you know, can become quickly sort of offended by you encroaching into that space um, and telling them how to eat or what to eat or what's better than what. Um, so that's that's the sort of constant balance that we're trying to strike. And we're not paragons either of healthy eating. So it's like, <laughs> not to say that like, we are just eat piles of lettuce every day anyway, so. <laughs> what are you guys doing to engage students in the local food system and educate them? Like, how are you approaching that? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, we, so the food zoo gets a lot of the sort of most of the student focused marketing um, because that's where most of our students eat. So we're playing this game constantly of like how to tag and identify student food products in there. We have some posters up about our relationship with Yellowstone grass fed beef and some posters up about Western Montana Growers Co-op. We have tags, everything that's that part of that farm to college local program is tagged with a different color tag that says farm to college on it. Um, when we get special things in, like when it's Dixon Melon season, you know, we put signs out that say Dixon Melon and we broadcast that through a variety of sort of media, social media stuff and internet on our website. Um, Stasha has a board that we set up inside. As soon as you walk down in the food zoo, there's a little chalkboard and it's just got that week's harvest on it, you know, so look for these things throughout the food zoo. Um, but again, it's, it's limited in sort of how much time people are going to spend digesting that information and how much you can really get across in there. So that's always been sort of a, an ongoing discussion about how to market some of that stuff. Um, we've done other things where we've brought in vendors. Um, we do a meal, it used to be called the Feastival, where we, it would be all Montana products. Um, and we would invite vendors to come and talk at that and sort of showcase some of their things. That's sort of lived on in a different iteration. It's now called The Meal, and it's sort of more oriented towards new students and their families. But the focus is still Montana products. So, you know, as you come onto campus and you, you're a freshman and you're there with your parents, and you're moving into the dorm, we do this big dinner for everybody on the Oval um, where we sort of sign, we provide signage about who those vendors are and what that meal looks like and how, what the Farm to College program is all about. A lot of it's direct to students, so Stasha and I talk in classrooms all the time. Um, we're trying to get the word out more and more that we're here as a resource for professors, but I think that's you know picking up steam, but I often go to classes and just talk about some of these issues, talk about you know what dining is doing in this space, um, you know, and what students can do to support that. Um, there's all sorts of, yeah, there's all sorts of ways, but it's always this question of like, how much do they care versus how much are they sort of exhausted by hearing this? We've done um, some really neat pop-up events. So we'll just set up by the statue on campus with like one year I made bruschetta with the garden tomatoes and we had garden cucumbers with some Amalthea goat cheese on it and was just handing out free food. And I was sitting there yelling free food and one, 
you know, when you're sta if you've ever done tabling, it's it's always really funny because people just avoid eye contact at every <laughs> every chance possible. And so I wasn't asking anything. I wasn't trying to sign you up for Bible study or anything. I was just literally giving food away. And they're college students. But still, like, just being behind a table, there was sort of, like, this thing going on all day. And one girl came up to me, and she's like, what are you doing? I was like, well, I'm trying to raise awareness about Farm to College and our gardens and all these great programs that we have. And she, goes, and she just sort of gave me the eye roll, like, oh, yeah, that Farm to College thing again. But it was really insightful because I think there is a point at which your audience is sort of like, I get it, or, you know, I've been saturated by this information already. Um, so trying to be respectful of that to an extent, um, but also continuing to promote what we do. Do y'all want to walk a little bit? We can come see. So out here we have, like I said, road-based agriculture, but we can go look at my favorite ever tomato trellising method, and then we can see our orchard and meet our ducks, which is the best part. Come on over. sticker on it. What that is, it's grinding that food up and then there's a big centrifuge that's spinning out that water. That water then gets put back into that gray water circle to just feed more stuff down into it. Um, the nice thing about this is it's very little from that kitchen that can't be composted. So there are a few things like the individually wrapped ice cream bars where they, these guys are having to put that into a trash bin. But the napkins, the chicken bones, the ketchup piles, anything that's food related can get scraped into this waste stream here. Comes down here, there's a big auger in here. So after it gets spin and centrifuge, it augers up and then it spits it out this thing. And what you have is just a big pile of semi-wet, pulped up, gross food waste. Um, these will fill up over the course of a few hours. As they fill up, they get loaded into one of two of these Somat dehydrators. So, again, these are just big electric ovens. Um, they run about 18 to 20 hour cycles. They do suck a fair bit of energy. You can see they're on 20 over here. Um, what it is, and I'll open it up for you guys, but it, it's just a big oven with these augers in it. what you have, this is the finished product. So you can touch it, it's totally innocuous. One of the nice parts of the oven aspect is that it, it kills any pathogens, which then allows us to do meat and dairy. That's why most people don't have meat and dairy in their compost because of pathogens. Uh, but heating it up for that long at that temperature, basically what you get is this really innocuous material. Super lightweight, doesn't smell that bad really easy to move around. So as these fill up, finish what they're doing, these guys load them into these green buckets, stack them up. And then again, Stasha will come in here once a week, take the buckets out, put them in the van, and drive them up to the peas farm. So that's sort of the whole cycle that's happening back here. Uh, again, some of the challenges is just energy use. Both the pulper, but especially these guys are using a ton of energy. When you 
other challenge is that these, you see they aren't connected to any venting systems. So all that heat and moisture gets vented out the back and the vents of the machines into this room. And what it does, is because this building is really old and the HVAC system is not that great, it messes with the HVAC system for the whole building because it's reading the moisture content, the humidity and the temperature of this room is influencing that in other areas of the building. So the, the system is trying to balance that constantly. This is the Lamasin Garden, so there's some different things going on that we can talk about. Um, but I also want to give you all an opportunity to ask questions if you have it, so we're not just talking at you the whole yeah, time. Yeah, that's not our favorite. The Lamasin Garden has the same um, motivations as the South Oak Garden. So this is used as a teaching space. We grow food here. Um, you can see down here we have raised beds and all of these are ADA accessible, which is really great, so it means we can welcome everyone into this space. Um, we do a lot of our workshops here because it's on campus and it's easier for folks to get to. Um, and it's also a bit more of a diverse space because we have the raised beds, we have our more row-based agriculture over there, and then we have the food forest in the back that we'll go look at. So there's a lot of different things going on. Um, and this garden was started in a bunch of different stages. The office down there, that's the dining director's office, and this used to just be a concrete patio. And you just see students out here like smoking cigarettes all the time and thought that there could be a better use for this space. So it started with just these raised beds, and then it expanded into that upper area, and then finally expanded out into the food forest. So it's had a couple um, iterations of what it's looked like. How, How old is this? How big is this space? This is, that's a great question. You know the square footage? No. No. <laughs> I'm working on saying no when I don't know. That's good. Instead of just like, it's, yeah. How old is the food forest? <laughs> food forest is about five years. Mm -hmm. So it's producing food and stuff. Yep. We have uh, fruiting shrubs. We have herbs. Our beehive is back there. It's a perennial space. We also have a lot of pollinator plants back there. Um, and it's also an area where students have done a lot of experiments. Um, so it kind of, it does a little bit of everything. I think this garden is more focused on, I mean, even more so than South Ave on the educational components. Mm -hmm. South Ave is a bigger space. We could, it was sort of a blank slate to really think about production and how we could be efficient with that. Um, and while that's not like our underlying goal, um, it provided more opportunities to focus on that. This obviously gets a lot more student traffic. It's on campus. It's not a mile and a half down the road. Um, so this has evolved, I think, partly through a lot of the student interest and the different projects that have been going on. This greenhouse was a senior gift project. So they fundraised for it and um, brought in bad goat lumber and some other folks and built it using earth bags and um, so I think you know partly because it's we're here on campus and the students are here and um, we've been a lot more open to doing sort of little projects and this is where a lot of the sort of experimenting goes on and stuff like that yeah and it's just I mean again having ADA accessibility um, Having a greenhouse just adds to all that. Mm -hmm. is, are these two gardens, is there anything set in the curriculum where the students come through here automatically, or is it all? No, I wish. That would be awesome. I would love that. Um, but I go trolling for interns every semester, so I go to different classes. Um, there are several classes that have like internship components to them, and they'll send people my way. I do volunteer fairs and just try and like we just try and get out there as much as possible but there's no set requirement for people to be here at all i think one of the like oftentimes we feel a lot of questions from people who are trying to do similar things like this and they're wondering how do you justify this especially from a budget scenario and that to me is one of the trickier ones i mean i i joke that stash is probably the only farmer in the state who has a full benefit package um, and a retirement plan and all that um, but you know she's a full-time employee I'm a full-time employee I do other stuff outside the garden but you know a fair bit of my time is dedicated to this most all of Stasha's time is dedicated to this we pay two students um, uh, like eight months out of the year to work with us um, 
And then we we tallied up like the market value for all of our produce one year, and it was like thirteen thousand dollars. So that in no way offsets the costs that we're putting into it. So you know, a lot of what we do is make that argument through a different lens. You know, it's we don't have these gardens so that we can save money on our produce. We have these gardens so that we can teach students and provide a really living laboratory where they can come and engage in these things, learn about these things. Um, those are the things that are a little less tangible as far as putting a, a number on that, a dollar figure on that. Um, but that's sort of what I tell people when they're asking, how do I justify this to my boss who's going to want to see you know, what are the costs and how how is it going to return that investment. Um, oftentimes, unfortunately, it's you have to be a little creative with that argument um, because this is definitely not the most cost-effective way to get food into our operations. But it has lots of other benefits um, beyond that. And dining doesn't reap all those directly, but I think to the testament of our director and our, our management staff, they embrace that and they don't they aren't driven by this really myopic bottom line mentality they see okay we're part of this institution this institution is meant to educate people and so having these facilities having these types of spaces having a full-time garden manager um, all of that stuff is, is justified through that lens I think. Did you say you have bees? Yeah. Yeah. It you went to check on them during the day, oh yeah, I did. Them, and then the smoke got into the air system in the building, and, and so I got we, yelled at. So, <laughs> so I just got reprimanded, yeah. and now we don't check the bees until after working. Yeah, so I have to come after five or on a weekend if I want to work with them. So there are some workarounds that way. There was a lady with asthma; she had to go home. I think it's fair. I felt bad, but yeah. So there are some things like that, but just there hasn't been a lot of like you know the initial like fear based like oh they're gonna go sting everybody. So that's been really great. Yeah. So did you work that angle to ask for a raise? Oh, because I have to be here? No, I just make sure that overtime is covered. <laughs>
they said we have lights for them. So it's a yes. progressive for lights. And mm -hmm. they're like a 10 day cycle. Yep. So a few days without light, and then the covers off, and then a few days with light. It is Radio. very labor intensive. Mm -hmm. But it is a great solution to that sort of, you know, in the middle of the winter, we have fresh greens that are on our south corner. They grow in the window of the food zoo, and so as you walk down that hallway, you have to walk by this whole presentation of fresh greens. And you can see them. So you're not, you're not heating them? They're just using the heat in the building already? Yeah. Yeah, they just, it's warm enough in there all the time for them to germinate. And it's mostly like, we don't do any plants that really need a lot of heat, so it's mostly radishes are our primary one, and wheatgrass and buckwheat and some mustards. So they're all like pretty okay with the temperature. Are you to all the microgreens that they need? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually not producing like at my full level right now because they weren't using them. So I produce them for the food zoo, they go to the iron grizz, and catering uses them often too. That might be the only thing that's like really cost effective. <laughs> Yeah, food. microgreens are really expensive to buy. We are, yeah. I think we calculated that it's about like $25 a pound to produce, like counting my time. And the seed is very expensive because it's like specific microgreen seed that's bred for even germination and for even growth. Whereas like, like we grow daikon radish microgreens and that seed is way more expensive than daikon radish seeds for like edible roots because they like bred for all these other characteristics. Um, but it was like $60 a pound was something crazy to buy them what do you buy? fresh. Where? I don't know. This is the growers co-op. Sounds like something you should be. <laughs> grow microgreens? Grow the seeds. Oh, yes, it does. It's, yeah. That's a good idea. Can I quote Johnny? No, I don't, I don't actually want to do that. <laughs> Johnny says a fine job. Yeah. Yes, we've played around with mushroom cultivation. Mm -hmm. with... Yeah. Yeah. It's got yeah, that thing sticking out. <laughs> um, yeah, like I said, we, it's nice because a lot of the projects have come from students and different ideas. We have a student who's very into mushrooms and so we played around with trying to grow some from that somat material, um, and he had this whole setup in the basement of this building. Now he has his own business, growing and selling mushrooms. Um, Not necessarily because of us, but we helped him. We take a little bit of credit. A little bit of credit, yeah. yeah. But I think that's true. A lot of our garden employees who've graduated now, um, Sachin and I both have been here about three years, so we've seen employees and interns come all the way through our program and go on to jobs in you know, Garden City Harvest. And that I will take credit for. And, um, different farming and ag jobs where they really credit the time they spend working with Stasha as like why they got that job or why they continued on that path. Um, and those are some of those like returns on investments that we can talk about. And it's like, you know, where is the value in this? Well, what the university does is it hopefully sets people up to pursue careers and helps them figure out what they want to be. And, what they do. I think getting responses from some of our garden employees being like, I have this job partially because of you guys has for me been one of the most rewarding things. Do you have any plans to expand your acreage to make more of an impact to the system? It would be great. I think the process to get that South Ave garden off the ground was several years in the making. They went through all of campus looking at potential sites. Um, and the level of bureaucracy always astounds me. Um, and I don't mean this to sort of be negative, too negative about it, <laughs> but that is just one of the components. This is state land. Everything is regulated in different ways. This is the state arboretum. That was something I didn't really think about. So when we expanded that South Ave, there were a lot of discussions with the chair of the Arboretum Society about are you going to have to trim trees? Are you going to have to move them? Or are we going to have to cut them down? Um, so I think, you know, if we could, I don't know. Do you feel like you're at capacity with the amount of land you have to manage? 
Yeah, they'd either need to hire someone else or like hire someone to just do like microgreens or something. Because there's so many parts of my job, like I have to go to meetings and grow the microgreens and do the compost pickup every week. And so it's not like if I was just growing food and working in the garden all the time, I wouldn't really need the student help. Um, but there are a lot of parts to my position. And so if we were to expand, like people make noise about Fort Missoula sometimes. So there's a lot of university land out there, but it would have to... I mean, the operation could grow and change for sure, but I couldn't continue to like manage a lot more in the way that we are right now. I think an obvious solution to some of those challenges is getting the student labor increased. So there are lots of student groups that are interested in these issues that are available. Um, the flip side of that is student interest tends to ebb and flow with the individuals, and so one of the huge values that Stasha provides is she's just a you know living archive of the information that we have in the system. So you have students that are great and they you know they come and they work and they set these things up, and then they graduate and they take all that information with them. Um, and so potentially, yeah, I mean, I would definitely entertain expanding our growing operations, but we would need to figure out that labor component and um, those other logistics. But heck yeah, if you yeah. wanted to give us some land, <laughs> yeah. I would take it. Do you have any other questions? That was like all the content we had. Yeah. yeah. I mean I get the other thing we've really talked about is like how we work with the culinary staff. Oh yeah, that's important. Um, which I, yeah, would say is really important. I mean, again, it's part of it's that buy-in, finding people like, um, for a while early on, we were having some issues with, hey, we've got, you know, 200 pounds of zucchini, who wants it? Um, and people would be like, well, I, you know, I've got other stuff going on, I don't wanna value add 200 pounds of zucchini. I think we're at a point now though where most of our chefs and a couple are especially excited about it. And so um, you know, we're not fighting that battle as much as we used to, but that was certainly an extent. For cooks in the kitchen who are used to just ordering whatever food they need, to then you know, set up this system where it's like, here's what we have and you, you're obligated in a way to use it. Um, it took a little bit of finessing to get that system working well now, but it's you know it's pretty slick. Stasha puts out a harvest report once a week, goes to all of our everyone in the culinary staff, and then uh, people can just sign up on that sheet, and it deducts it from the total, and you can see who's taken what. So now there's even like some bartering back and forth. Like, oh, you took all the carrots, and I really need some of those, and so. We're getting to a point where it's sort of the reverse problem, where the, the demand is increasing and the chefs want it more than, instead of looking at it as this obligation, it's sort of just like, but that, I mean, they're involved throughout the whole process too. So we sit down in the winter time and Stasha, you know, a couple times a year actually, like post harvest, we'll sit down with them and say what went well, what didn't work well, you know, how did logistics work, delivery work, timing of all this stuff. And then they get another opportunity as we're doing garden planning to have input on, you know, I'd really like to see more of this, or I'd love it if you guys, you know, tried this specific variety out. Stasha group Cardoon? Cardoon? Cardoons. Cardoons this year. So that was a chef request. Um, purple potatoes. So there's some ownership there too, and I think that really helps because they're not just getting this produce and being like, you know, what do I got to do with this? But they're, they're involved with that process throughout the year, and they get to you know, provide a lot of input. And then I can bully them if I have to, because by the time the cardoons are ready, he had forgotten about them. And by the then I had it written down. I was like, no, you asked for these. You have to take them now. <laughs> so, thankfully it's not usually like that, but yeah, we're lucky to have a lot of buy-in and we've like, but it's been work to like create the culture. And I do, I put in a lot of effort to try and make it as easy for the culinary staff as possible. Yeah, and that's, a lot of it's just like human stuff. It's like acknowledging Inertia. that. Well, yeah, no, I just like your job is hard and their mm -hmm. job is hard and that like everybody is trying to make everything work for everyone else. So. so you also then coordinate all of the food that's coming across the state with uh, um, all of the various places that students eat on campus? At a macro level, yeah. Um, so 
you know, a lot of what I do is help set up relationships with vendors, um, help bring them into our system, introduce them to our culinary staff, some oversight of menu planning, um, and then some influence at that macro level of like, you know, these are the products that are available throughout the year. Here are your contacts at the Growers Co-op, and here's where you can get some great grass-finished beef. And, um, so I feel a lot of those questions, but it does come down, there's no way I could be everywhere in those kitchens. I mean, people are purchasing food every day, 100 times a day, in different operations all over campus. Um, and so you do really need to not just do that training, but to get people to a point where they see the value in what you're trying to do so that they can do it. Because there, you know, there have been instances where we'll make a department-wide decision, like our, our oil that we use for frying. We buy it from uh, Bob Quinn and Andrew Long up in Big Sandy. So it's just great safflower oil. And they're helping promote organic production. So they're helping convert land organic production and they're introducing this new crop that has really high potential to help people get off of that commodity weed cycle. Um, add, it, add to that that they pick up all of our used oil and process it into biodiesel. So we made this decision several years ago to just across the board and all of our fryers were going to use safflower oil. Um, and there was a little bit of policing on my part where six months would go by and I'd run purchasing reports and say, well, this is weird, you know, I've got a couple of cases of Cisco oil and a couple of cases there. And then tracking that down and saying, you know, what's happening? And it is just, it's just everyday human stuff where people, you know, oh, I, I forgot or I really needed this and I couldn't get it on that delivery day. Um, so there are components of that, but I don't want to be the bad guy, you know, like I don't, and I shouldn't have to be like, in a perfect system, these guys see that value and they get the so what of it, and so they they do it on their own. And my job is more conveying why we do it and less, you know, policing how we do it. Uh, and at an operation of this size, I think like, you you know you need to find that balance. I guess. So, is there a goal that's set at the beginning of every calendar or school year that we are going to buy? Like you say, you're up to 25 percent a year now local. Yeah. So how is that orchestrated throughout the entire food system on campus? How do you are you watching that goal every month and saying, hey, you know, we're slipping or we're above, or is there a budget component associated with that goal? Yeah, it's it's, it's complicated. I track it yearly, so I sit down at the end of the fiscal year, which is. Um, our fiscal year ends July 30th or 31st. And then I w usually will go through all the purchasing reports and tally up all of our local purchases and compare that year to year. Uh -huh. So that discussion doesn't happen that frequently throughout the year, but again, more on that sort of macro level where we'll sit down and say, okay, our purchases went up or they went down. Why is that? Um, that's sort of how it plays out from a strategy standpoint. The other big part of that is like menu planning. So we have an executive chef who oversees all of our operations. And then he's the top of this culinary hierarchy that then sort of breaks down into executive sous chefs and different departments and chef to cuisines and all that stuff. It's usually not the executive chef who does the ordering. It's usually someone a couple runs down. Um, but they're involved in the menu planning. So part of buying more local is developing menus that can accommodate what's available locally. Um, so we've done, we added a new concept over in the food court called Harvest, which is a grain bowl concept. If you've ever been to like Five on Black or some of these other restaurants, you go in, you get a scoop of brown rice or a starch, and then you can sort of tell the person what you'd like to add to that. Um, that was a great thing for us because you know, we can use kamut over there, and I can use lentils and those types of bases for those things. And then the whole idea of that concept is really a healthy option on that side of campus. And so it's a great place to highlight a lot of the garden produce and seasonal vegetables and stuff like that. Um, so the this, this strategizing of it is more sort of like 30,000 feet, I think. And then it does take just like, you know, if I feel like this department isn't, really doing what they should be doing I might go talk to the chef and say like well, you know why is this what's going on and get to the bottom of that 
but again, trying to work with people and not being this sort of like this big bad like sustainable. The sustainable. Right. Right. Yeah. Is there anything that your chefs have requested that you're like absolutely not not doing? It? Yeah. Yeah. So I made the mistake this year of saying yes to too many things, like. Um, the cartoons were one. I tried to grow jicama. I got one thing that was this big. It was one. so. There are sometimes that like I have gotten more assertive and been like no, but like especially this past year we got a lot of new chefs and they like had all this like new chef energy and they're from California and Missouri and like had lots of ideas about what we could grow. And so it's kind of a mix between. And I try new things every year. We try and keep it balanced between like the things that we know will be effective and like getting new and crazy. Um, so I always try and keep that balance, but I do say no sometimes. I'm trying to, oh, one chef wanted me to grow some um, corn. And just with the space I have, it's just <laughs> not like, you're gonna get like six ears of corn for like a whole bunch of space. Yeah. So that was an example of where I said no. So it happens. But they are like, there's a lot of dialogue and like we have those planning meetings in the fall and that's massively helpful because they're happy and then hopefully I'm happy and get to express myself well about why I feel the way I do about what they want me to grow. And are the, are the various dining halls and the chefs, are they given a comparison of this is how much local is going to cost, this is how much conventional or, or Cisco food is going to cost? and. Do they then have to balance that with the bottom line of how much they're allowed to spend in their particular uh, facility? Yeah, this is part of part of the whole picture that I am actually not that involved with. Like, I don't. Sasha and I don't have a budget for our operations. I mean, we everything that we build, we buy seeds, we buy garden equipment. It gets billed to the main department account, um, and so a lot of these chefs complain because over the years has been this expectation that they really prioritize local mm -hmm. and then they'll prioritize local and their food costs will increase or their labor costs will increase and they'll go they have to go into monthly budget meetings and, and explain their profit and loss sheets and say you know how come your costs went up and so they were hearing sort of two different stories at the same time you really need to prioritize local but you really need to run a really tight ship and save as much money as possible um, so I think what is critical to this component is people at the top who are willing to say yes, but in a way, you know, like you you need to be running a tight ship. You need to you know, be hitting your budget numbers. But if you're going over because you're you're targeting this other goal, we are sympathetic of that, and we're not going to ride you in this budget meeting for doing that. Um, and I think that. We figured that out. So our director for a very long time, Farm to College, was his legacy. It was the thing that he was the most excited about. And he, but he was also a bear of a guy. I mean, he was just, he was very, um, I don't know. <laughs> he wasn't afraid to like call you out and to be like pretty up in your face about stuff. And. So he would do this sometimes, I think, where he would say, you know, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, and then someone would come in and say, how come you're, you know, $5,000 over budget for this semester? Um, our new director is um, also very passionate, but he's a little more sympathetic, I think, about people's needs, and um, so it seems to have mellowed out a little bit. But, I mean, the understanding is sort of like, if, if your costs increase because of these other goals, that's okay. But if your costs increase because you're lazy or you're not running your staff very efficiently or you're not doing good scheduling, it's a different issue. Uh, but I talk about this all the time. I mean, like as a as a business, like what is our mission? What is our like right. our like metric of success? Right. And we don't have shareholders. We're not like maximizing profit for anybody. So if we if we run a sloppy ship and we lose a ton of money and we can't pay our employees and we have to lay people off or close operations, those are the business sides of things that if we don't do them well, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. But at the same time, we're in a, in a, I think, a much better situation than a lot of businesses because nobody's saying, hey, you could have made $5,000 more if you didn't buy that safflower oil from Big Sandy or you didn't employ that garden manager, you know, who grew $13,000 worth of crops or whatever. Like, 
it really takes people with a vision broader than the bottom line to be able to say, okay, like, how are we measuring our success? There are these educational components. There, there is definitely the, the business component of things. Um, and I, that's something that I have to constantly remind myself of because nobody's asking me, like, are you hitting your budget targets? Yeah. I'm like, no, I'm just spending money. <laughs> and they don't, that's what's interesting. So I'm just thinking about this from uh, the Kalispell School District when they hired their first uh, um, food director and she was very committed to local and they said you if you can replace that item with a local item for the same price point go for it so she had that that's what I was curious about does the university have some vision like we're gonna stick at 25 I know you were 13 percent maybe 10 years ago yeah. obviously now you're even more it appears a commitment but is it are there annual goals or are there discussions like that that you know we're, we want to reach a goal of 45 percent local by the year 20 whatever or is it just is there a long-term game here that the university sees with respect to yeah so local there or sustainable or whatever there's a lot of discussions around this um, like there's an organization called Real Food Challenge, which a lot of universities have signed up for, and they have a calculator where you can put in a year's worth of purchase data, and it will spit out this number of real, like real food that you've bought. And real food is a definition that they've come up with that includes metrics of you know, the environmental impact, the nutrition impact, local economies impact, um, humane, animal welfare. animal welfare, stuff like that. But it's their definition, and they're trying to do is create that base. Uh, we signed up for that. We ran the calculator a couple times. We did actually really well. Um, but we had some issues with it because it was somebody else's definition that didn't always fit what we had. So there was food that, you know, we called farm to college. It didn't qualify as real food because it was outside of their local radius. I think of food like I think of water. We all live in watersheds. We all live in food sheds. So this sort of application of a, a radius of this is local and good because it's within 250 miles never really sticks with me. Right. Um, but right now I am working with a student to try to build a calculator to look at the, the greenhouse gas effects of our purchases. Um, so doing all this life cycle analysis on all these different food products and then hopefully having that spit out a number of metric tons of carbon with the hope of then saying, okay, we're at this level, let's you know, let's shoot to shrink that carbon footprint by this much over the next five years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That project is now, like um, we're talking to other nonprofits and researchers about the possibility of expanding that to take into these other considerations. So like one group is really looking at land use and water use. Um, could you build that into a calculator? Um, and then could you build in some of these things like animal welfare social justice issues into that calculator. Um, so it's, but it, it always sort of runs up against this, you, you're trying to create a baseline, like a broad baseline to apply to all these different institutions that have very unique situations. Um, I think that goal setting is probably something we should look more closely at because it, it does give you something to sort of pursue. Um, but it also like, it can be really arbitrary. Like our enrollment's down significantly. So our farm to college purchases are down from what they were. Mm -hmm. But our, you know, so if you report that as a total dollar amount, which is what we've done since 2003, you know, what you've seen now is it's sort of leveled off. Right. If you report it as a percentage of your total purchases, that's different. So do I have to go back and then sort of rejigger the sure. data? And then ratio is due to. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so do you do it? and all these different lenses that you can sort of look through and judge yourself on. Um, I think the money one is really impactful because the people who don't give a crap about the environmental or the local components or whatever, oftentimes do care about the money bit. So, you know, I don't, I don't know if you were there at lunch, but I was talking about our farm to college purchases have gone steadily up since 2003 from like 80,000 to about a little under a million every year. And our food cost, which is a measure of how much you spend on food, has gone steadily down since that time. Huh. And that's not a function of 
local food costing less. That's a function of the department really committing to this strategy and doing other things to mitigate cost. So one of the big ones now is like these is plant forward diets. So we're promoting more plant-based diets. It's healthier for our guests. It's better for the environment and it costs less money. And so shrinking our animal protein portions mm -hmm. and blending our burgers with mushrooms and serving more plants based entrees, you know, like picking a couple nights out of the week to do vegan entrees. We have a shepherd's pie that's a vegan shepherd's pie. Um, and we, you know, we used to just be, the expectation was every night there's a meat entree in the food zoo and you walk in and that's what's for dinner. All this other stuff is just sort of accompanying that. But, you know, what's for dinner tonight is skirt steak or it's chicken thighs or it's, you know, that animal mm -hmm. protein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know, what I was saying at lunch is that the gut reaction from a lot of people is that sounds difficult and so I'm not sure I want to do it. You know, but there are a million ways to control costs. If, you know, in that scenario, you know, someone's being asked to sub a one for one, like that to me seems like a bad strategy. Well, it's like, probably a way to try to stop it from happening, yeah. right? So like <laughs> zoom out and say like, okay, yeah. you can sub these things if in the aggregate, yeah. your budget still comes in about what it was. Exactly. But exactly. To, to sort of break it down to yep. this really micro level of like, if you can provide this local product for the same as that local product, you're then missing that opportunity to look holistically like, maybe we can change our menus. Maybe we can find ways to cut costs in other areas. Well, gosh, if it sounds like if you trying to get this handle on food waste, think of a thousand extra pounds of, I mean, think what that would do for your budget yeah. to have zero waste. I mean, from the plate into the, system there that that's still that number I won't forget that's a huge amount of waste and that's true that would be a giant piece on the other side of the ledger if you could stop the customer your guests from wasting that much food yeah I mean that's an amazing thing to probably focus on so you're right there's all these different pieces here that which makes the most impact or where do we want to focus for a while and every fall you probably have to refocus it again when you get a new batch of students coming in yeah yeah and it's absolutely. all self-serve yeah, yeah, over here, but it's, you know, we have all these different operations. And there's just like no, there's no end to the different initiatives and the ways to engage the students. And, and that's a good thing, mm -hmm. you know, I think that that's really a wonderful thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it is, it is challenging, I think, but like any difficult thing, we tend to just default to like, well, that's hard and I don't really see how that's possible. Mm -hmm. um, and it just takes some dedicated people to say, actually, like, I've seen this work, you know, and that's a big thing I think about a lot is like if what we're doing here can then inspire other folks or at least provide a case study for like, oh, that is, that's a functional system, you know, we can control our food costs and buy more local food, like, then it just, it dissuages or it pushes that excuse aside. Mm -hmm. You can then say, I know this works. Mm -hmm. Reset those patterns. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Do you grow in the wintertime, or are you? Not much anything. Okay. Microgreens. Okay, do you, uh, so do you have any greenhouses or anything you can grow else? No, this, and this isn't heated at all, so really, in order to grow in the winter, you need supplemental light and heat. Um, but we grow the microgreens inside year-round. Um, that's really it. That's tough. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, then, like, when we're talking about the, like, percentage of purchasing and like if we have a monthly goal like obviously in Montana in February our local purchases are like we do get a lot from the from Renan um, and the processing centers but it goes way down compared to September where we can get pretty much anything we could dream of. Do you get so you get local produce from area farms? And so you could Primarily through the food. Western Montana Growers Co-op because oh, okay. that aggregates it for us so that makes having that as a partner is way easier for us and it's really helpful. Yeah, I mean, Western Montana is a pretty great place to try to do this between the Growers Co-op, between Rosie and those guys at Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center, the, you know, CFAC and NCAT and Aero and all these groups that are you know, in this space working on these problems collaboratively. Um, I think I can't say enough about that element of it. I mean, I think we've done a lot of great stuff here, but we've benefited from the community at large 
and the different infrastructure that has sort of already been in place. I mean, Nagar's co-op started the same year the Farm to College program did, and we were their biggest anchor account. I mean, we said we'd love to work with you guys, and when they, you know, when they said we want to sort of get this off the ground, that provided this opportunity to say, okay, that's a substantial amount of revenue. We can work with the university. We are. You know, we're not peanuts to them anymore, but they've grown to a point now where we're no longer anywhere near their largest customer. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. you know, now they're supplying large grocery stores. And, um, yeah, so I think those those components shouldn't be overlooked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a great partnership because then we get to receive from them, we benefit from this wonderful food system, but we are, like Trevor said, like an anchor, like we are always going to be buying a lot of food because there's always going to be, even if enrollment's down, we're still going to be feeding students. So we're like income that a farmer can rely on. And a lot of like new startups will come to us and make pitches and sometimes we take it, sometimes we don't. Um, like our hummus is made from a local small company, right? We make that. Oh, we make that one. Okay, never mind. There's better examples than that. <laughs> okay, what's an example? Honey, we we'll buy like honey from Stevensville. Yeah, the beef thing. I mean, we've had this long-term relationship yeah. with Yellowstone Grassfed, and then I was approached by Bart Morris. Him and his wife own Oxbow Beef, and they ranch just south of town here. And they host tons of students every year through EVST courses and different academic departments um, to teach them about holistic rangeland management, um, grass finished beef and how that all works. And so he sort of came to me, he said, I would love to sell you guys beef. You know, I'm already connected to the university, I'm right here in town. Um, and so I had a long discussion with him um, and he now sells to our catering department. They, all their ground beef and a lot of their primals come from Bart. But it was interesting for both of us. I mean, often I think vendors look at us and say oh it's a huge amount of volume but you know we're also we buy wholesale we buy in bulk and so there's there's usually some sort of compromise there you know Bart realized that he couldn't sell to us his ground beef what he would sell it to the good food store necessarily because the good food store can price it accordingly we can't you know we can change the price of our hamburgers and stuff but it's a much it's a much tougher and stricter sort of market in that way. So he came down on his price and you know I he was hoping to sell us all his beef and I was like well I, I can't at that price but for this price I can give you this chunk of the pie and you know maybe that grows into something else. So you talked earlier about how you define local is, Mon is the state of Montana. Do you get any pushback from people saying, well, you could go 50 miles to Idaho and get this product instead of going to Eastern Montana to get this? Like, how, like, do you get, especially when it comes down to price and this carbon footprint? Yeah. Kind of I don't think anybody, um, <laughs> I often think that people are paying more attention to that type of data than they are, you know, like, mm -hmm. I, I, I get worried about that sometimes because I'm so embedded in like our purchase data and I'm like, what if somebody know that we called they're like our ice purchases local? Like, because that's actually true. Like we have a local company we buy ice from and I often am like, uh, like a, this is really a local ag product. Um, but I think if that was out there, I'd be, I'd sort of welcome that debate and I've had it with other people. Like um, the carbon footprint thing, is important to me, but transportation is a pretty small chunk of the whole pie. Um, oftentimes, it's, it's production methods or just what the commodity is. You know, so like meat and dairy, the footprint of that is so much larger than plant-based foods. So if it's, you know, you're talking about, could you get it from Idaho and Washington? Like we we do without hesitation if that's available. Um, if that product, like Wilcox eggs, is an interesting one because they get a lot of their eggs from the Uterite farms around Great Falls, but not all of them. We buy primarily their liquid product. So they're the liquid product, they take eggs that are sort of non-conforming eggs, and then they send them to their plant, in, I think Washington or Oregon, where they have their big liquid egg centrifuge, and then they that's where they sell the liquid egg product from. There's no way to know how many of those eggs in that liquid egg product came from Great Falls versus Washington or Oregon. But I know Andy Wilcox, and I know 
how they run their operations. And we've sent people to the plant in Grand Prairie Falls, and I've talked to Andy at length about what they're doing in Washington and Oregon. Um, and so we call Wilcox Eggs Farm to College because we know there's some impact with their operations in Great Falls. But I've had this like weird paranoia of like, what if somebody really like came down on me and said, you know, Trevor, you, know, you should really only account that for like one third of what it is because they're getting eggs from Washington and Oregon as well. Um, but at the end of the day, like I have to remind myself, these are all like weird, arbitrary conversations that we're having. You know, like. Primarily we buy from Wilcox because they have this commitment to sustainability and they're helping like with the Huterites they're helping teach them about apiaries and like how to build poultry housing that's better for the birds and more humane. So they have certain requirements and they have you know, a lot of cage free products and I feel really good working with a company like that because I know those guys and I know those commitments. Um, so if you know, their product counts as local or if it counts as sustainable or it doesn't count for anything, I think, you know, really it's can you justify that um, and do you feel good about that? Where it comes to like these more arbitrary conversations is like the marketing component of it. And that's where I think it gets really sticky. And I mentioned earlier like MSU has been trying to sort of play catch up with their farm to campus program and doing a lot of what we've done and I think it's great and I've been trying to help them sort of connect with some of these products um, but we've laughed for many years because they used to count Pepsi as a farm to campus product <laughs> because there was a bottler in, in Bozeman um, but the reason they did that right is because there's this pressure to yeah. present what you're doing and to like so we made this announcement the first year we hit a million dollars in annual purchases for farm to college we put out a press release and we felt great about it. One year later, a press release comes out from MSU. It's almost verbatim to what my press release was. We hit a million dollars in local food purchases. And I'm like, it's part of me that feels sort of bitter. And I'm like, <laughs> but then I have to step back and realize like, what is the end goal of this? Like the end goal of this is helping create a better food system. So if those guys are motivated by competing with us, great. That means that they're gonna buy more local food. So, but yeah, I mean, I think the marketing thing is sometimes competing with like the actual goal of what that program is because you're tempted to, to you know, it. frame it and yeah, totally. Do you guys, uh, do you have a follow system? Do you let it have a follow? Not, I haven't done a whole year. We do cover cropping. Um, I'll do like sometimes like just a like these guys just had a spring mix first thing and so they've been cover crop for most of the year um but we don't have the gear to or like the mechanized um gear to bust up um like the big like if i were to do a perennial cover crop it would, I would be like my myself with a digging fork to bust that up later so that's pretty onerous for us um, and we are so small, like you said, that it's hard to like give up land like that. But I do a lot of compost, I do a lot of cover cropping, um, I do very minimal tillage, so that's how we try a lot of crop rotation, um, so that's how we, like I really try and be a steward of the soil ecosystem, but we don't do a long-term fallow. And what are your favorite crops? I have been experimenting with a couple different things. Um, I really like mixes because I like the diversity that you get both like above and below ground with like diversity of root structures and then a diversity of plants um, and usually do a mix of grasses and legumes. I had been doing winter rye as my grass but I'm getting away from that because that doesn't winter kill here so I'm digging up a lot of big grass in the spring and that's kind of a bummer. Um, but if you want to look that one over there is mammoth red clover, hairy vetch, winter rye, and there were field peas, but they have died back. And then what we have going on at South are oats, field peas, and vetch. Field peas and vetch. Okay. Well. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. If yeah, any of right. you are in town next week on Thursday from 4:30 to 6, right here, we're having our duck party.